I want to invite you to find your seats. We're going to worship the Lord together. this morning to be able to come in and freely worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, Isaiah chapter 55, one of my favorite portions of scripture, uh, verses 6 through 11 says this, says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher, the ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, 
without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return without successfully accomplishing what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Father, we thank you so much this morning that we get to worship you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, we know that even though we've already started worship and declaring your name throughout the rest of this service and through the preaching of the word, your word will not return void. Father, we've looked to every situation and every strength and every struggle that has happened this week. Lord, we declare the word of the Lord over that. In Jesus' name this morning, let's lift our voice and declare his name and who he is in our situation through worship this morning. Morning, amen.
There is a hill I cherish Where stood a precious tree The emblem of salvation The gift of
wants to know his love. My heart is set on Christ, and I will count all else as a loss. The greatest of my crowns means nothing to me now. Right count it up the cost, and all my wealth is in the Jesus, you are the one thing matters one day in your cause than a thousand elsewhere. Jesus, Jesus. love vast as the ocean loving kindness as a flood where the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is a love will not remember who can see to sing his praise he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days on the mount of crucifixion Mountains open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Float a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty river Poured in sensing from above Heaven's peace Justice kissed again. 
darkness I called your name into the darkness your mercy came you called me out lifted me up how great is your love you bore my weakness you took my shame buried my burdens in fields of grace you called me out lifted me up how great is your
Father, we, we exalt your name, Lord. Lord, you are the one who first loved us, God. Lord, how great is your love. Father, we just ask that even as your Holy Spirit has already moved through worship, Lord, for the rest of this service, Father, we just ask that you uh, have the freedom for your will and your way to move uh, in Jesus' name. Lord, you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy to be praised, God. Lord, your, your name is, is, is the highest, and the highest banner on the highest mountain. That's still not enough. But Lord, Lord, we come this morning, we honor you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you, team. Amazing. Isn't it good just to be able to be in church these days? Just to come hang out with one another and praise Jesus? Man, it is, it is awesome. Well, hey, I want to certainly uh, welcome you this morning. Uh, it's good to, good to be here, right, uh, in church. want to welcome those who are here uh, physically with us, but also those who are joining us online via the, uh, via the live stream. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. What a great time to be able to get together as a local church, uh, one to another. So much of what we do doesn't necessarily happen on a Sunday, right? It happens in relationship one to another, and this is how we get connected. Uh, so thanks for being here again. Welcome. If this is your first time, I uh, want to make sure that you're prepared for that. We do have a visitor's packet virtually that you can go and you can fill out. We want to record your time with us, whether you're here with us physically this morning or, we're, like I said, whether you're joining us online. Uh, the biggest thing is us connecting with you. We want to be able to connect, have a conversation. So, again, thanks so much for joining us. Glad that you're here. I want to make sure that you know what's going on as far as announcements, things like that. Nursery is open. Uh, that's a big thing that we can constantly cheer for. There was a number of weeks where we didn't have a nursery, uh, so that is there. It's a big need, so uh, make sure that you, uh, that you know that. Um, Children's Church, uh, ages 3 to 6, there is a program there. Um, we want to make sure that we still follow protocols, so anytime you're up from your seat, make sure that you mask up. Certainly uh, the instructors uh, in those classes will be following protocols as well. But that's Children's Church, ages 3 through 6. Uh, nothing necessarily for the kids uh, seven and older at this point. We are working on that, but we do have some coloring pages uh, available back at the back of the room, so we will have a time of break. Make sure that you grab some of those if that one uh, applies to you for coloring pages. want to make sure that you're aware about new members class. We do this from time to time. New members class uh, via Zoom, February 25th at 7 p.m. Not only did I talk about relationship being important in local church, right? The church body getting to know one another, but this is a place where new members can come and really begin to walk through and dig into what it means to be part of the body of Christ. Not only as a whole, but also as a local church, relating one to another, but also knowing theologically what we believe and why we believe it. So new members class, again, February 25th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Um, if you're interested in that, make sure that you see Pastor Ben or sign up or contact the church office. Uh, but that is something that is uh, it's a, it's a good time and a lot of good information there as well. Want to make sure that you can save this date for Prophetic Presbytery. Uh, these dates, actually, April 16th through the 22nd. Uh, prophetic Presbytery is a time where we as a church, a local church, but also a group of churches, really dedicate some days just to hearing from the Lord. Isn't that a good thing where we can, we can lay hands on some folks and, and really see what the Lord is doing prophetically, not only in some individuals, right? We clap and we cheer and we get excited for what the Lord says to individuals, but also... We're, again, a body of Christ, right? So a local church, we can cheer on those folks who are getting presbytery uh, throughout the year and understand that it not only affects them, but it affects us as a local church as well. So also always an exciting time, an exciting time not only for our friends and, and, and other members, but also for the local church as well. So make sure that you have those dates set aside. I'd hate for you to miss any of it. Again, April 16th through the 22nd, uh, prophetic presbytery there. Want to make sure that you know about Fusion. So youth happens on Monday nights, but Fusion for youth ages 10 through 12. What a great bridge this has been. Uh, that's going to be happening the fourth Monday of each month uh, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. As always, that'll be taking place over at CFC Potsdam. So if you have folks that fit into that age group, what a great time. What a great bridge it is uh, into youth ministry uh, proper. And then, obviously, there's a lot of good things that happen there. This is where young people get ignited, uh, really, per se, about what the things of God are what they are, how they apply to them, not only individually, but again, as a local church. So again, fusion happening. Make sure that you write that down. Okay, well, let's do this. Um, we will have some giving happen. We're not going to be doing it like we normally would, but as you remember, there's, uh, there's a 
bucket in the back. If you're here physically, you can certainly give there. If you're watching or viewing online, certainly go to our website or through the app. There's a give button. We want to make sure that you have the ability to do that for local tithes and offerings. Uh, also, if you wanted to give to a specific ministry, there's a place there for you to designate that as well. Uh, but you can go ahead and do that. Again, physically here, the bucket in the back on your way out. Or you can do it online or through the app. Again, that give button will help you do that. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's do this. Let's take, uh, let's take five minutes. We'll have the young people go to their programs, and we'll meet right back here. Pastor Rick Sinclair is going to be sharing the word with us this morning. So let's take a quick break and get right on back. Thank you.
Okay. I want to invite you to just uh, come back to your seats here. Certainly getting the kids off to their program. That's a good thing. But if you come back, we'll, uh, we'll carry on with the service. Well, I wanted to mention this morning that uh, obviously for those that are in the room, uh, you might notice that Pastor Ben and family are not here this morning uh, with us here in Madrid. Uh, they are actually over at CFC Potsdam today. Uh, Pastor Ben is sharing the word over there, so uh, be thinking of him and be praying for them as well. Uh, we know it's going to be a, a good time and a great uh, word that's delivered there. But that means that we have a wonderful opportunity uh, to be able to have uh, Pastor Rick and Darlene with us this morning. Welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, Pastor Rick Sinclair, why don't you come on forward? You're going to be sharing the word with us this morning. So Pastor Rick has just been so foundational, and obviously uh, our church and the group of churches that we have, just continuing to deliver the word and, and move into the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you for being faithful. That's what I can say this morning. So um, let's preach. On? There we go. Okay, good. I didn't know if, uh, okay, mute switch. Great to see, uh, great to see you folks and uh, excited about being here. Don't uh, have, feel like I haven't been here. Well, I don't think I've been here a whole lot on Sunday morning in quite a while. Um, just a year ago, Darlene and I were in Colombia and uh, uh, having a great time down there and hearing reports about some virus in China and People concerned about, uh, you know, getting home from different places, and it wasn't a big deal. And then uh, here we are a year later, and it's pretty amazing, right? Um, and uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, continuing the series here. It's a real privilege um, uh, to, uh, we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit. Before we do that, I just want to, one, give a re quick report on our lives. Number two, share a just a prophetic word with you, uh, something I sensed during the uh, uh, the time of worship, and then we'll, we'll get into the study, uh, continuing your series on foundational issues of the Christian life. First of all, an update on, on us. Uh, most of you, I think, we've seen a little bit, at least anyway, in the last year. Um, I just want to say that in spite of whatever is happening in the world around us and COVID and politics and everything else, uh, Jesus is on the throne. Darlene and I are just not only surviving, we're thriving. I uh, feel like it's been a great season for us. I uh, feel like we're walking in the joy of the Lord in a, in a new measure, um, just enjoying our fellowship together, our you know, times with the saints, whatever we do get, uh, times in the Word of God. Uh, uh, really, it's, it's, in some ways, it's been a very rich, rich season. And what, uh, you know, what looks like uh, you know, difficulty on the outside, the Lord has turned into some real blessing. Uh, so it's really been a very, very good season for us. Thank you for, uh, for your prayers. I know I, I hear from a lot of you off and on by email, text message, phone calls, things like that. Continue to pray for us. We've been very, very healthy and, and thankful to the Lord uh, for all he's doing. So uh, the word of God is continuing to go out. He's using us. We're active in him. Um, this year, of course, been different for us. I've been spending more, much more time in Moira uh, since, uh, since April of last year. And, uh, but also in the last four months, been spending time with a church down in New York City, helping them uh, during a season. Uh, one of our college alumni, uh, Renata Duval, I don't know if some of you might have met Renata. She was a Clarkson student back in 2008, 9, somewhere around there. Um, Renata Duval uh, uh, left school she, uh, at, around then, and she got married in 2001, 2011 rather, uh, to Bo, Bo Lee. And uh, now, six years ago, they went and planted a church in New York City, uh, right? Uh, and they're meeting in, uh, down near Union Square uh, in Lower Manhattan. And uh, uh, just in October, it just seemed like Bo was really, really tired and needed a rest. So uh, I've been helping him and helping the church down there during his sabbatical. So uh, that's been kind of a, uh, an op interesting opportunity. And we can go there because it's in New York State. I've had to cancel travel plans to other places, uh, but we can still go back and forth to New York City. So it's been a, a good fit and a good opportunity to help them. So thank you for your encouragement of us through the year, continued prayer support. It really has been in some ways a great
great year. Second thing, um, there was a phrase that was going through my head. A lot of times it happens during times of worship. But by the way, worship team, thank you so much for your faithfulness. It's just so good to, uh, to gather together to, to lift up praises to our God. Uh, really thank you very much. And the worship team really helps us to do that. Um, uh, the phrase that kept coming through my head, uh, a biblical phrase, was this. And it's like in the Bible, like I don't know how many times, like a hundred, you know, hundred plus, it came to pass. It came to pass. And it came to pass. But it came to pass. And I just, I just feel impressed to tell you, whatever we're going through, it's going to pass. It really is. Um, you know, what's that phrase from the book of Psalms? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Sometimes feel like, sometimes things feel like forever, um, but they are just a moment. And my heart, my confidence is, Lord, in this thing that's here, this thing we're going through, some of it, you know, certainly related to COVID and protocols and the, just the strange rhythms of society, some of it having to do with the perilous times in which we live. Clearly, we're seeing the, uh, the, the, the birth pangs, so to speak, of, of the, the breakdown of the fabric of society politically, I mean, socially, in every way. Uh, I want you to know whatever it is you, on top of all that, personally are going through, it comes to pass. And in the process, God uses it for the good of those who love him and who th those who are the called according to his purpose. He works things in us through those things that we go through, through those pressures. I want to look at a couple of scriptures along those lines. I want you to first of all look at Romans chapter 5. If you have your Bible, Kevin, if, if are you in the sound booth? I have my glasses on. Yep, okay, um, thanks. Uh, Romans chapter 5, if you look at that for a second. Let's look at uh, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, oh, that'll preach. We could park right there for like an afternoon, right? Uh, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Basically, what he says is, look what we have right now, look what we have in the age to come. And with that, verse 3, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. Have you been glorying? Come on, saints. <laughs> Can't tell. You got masks on. I, no, I'm just kidding. Um, have you been glorying in the tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance? And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Can you feel all that perseverance being worked into you, all that character? Sometimes we can't. Sometimes we don't feel it. We're going through difficulties, and we're, we're not sure what's going on. The Scripture tells us that in tribulations, God's working. And verse 5, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I want to give you a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego word this morning. That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego word is this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were commanded to worship the golden image. They wouldn't do it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the king told them, tell you what, I'll give you a second chance. They said, we don't need a second chance. He said, well, then you're going into the fiery furnace. They went into the fiery furnace. The scripture amazingly says when they looked into the fiery furnace, they not only saw Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego, but there was a fourth man like the Son of Man. Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up in that fiery furnace. They came out, and they didn't smell like smoke. And number two, they had a testimony. I'm telling you, they weren't bowing down to any golden images after that. I mean, if there was ever a doubt, no more, right? In other words, they came out of that not smelling like smoke and with an absolute confidence God came through. Imagine that testimony. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's an amazing thing. Saints, we can come through the things we go through with an amazing testimony, but also not smelling like smoke. That's one of my prayers for myself on a continual basis. Lord, whatever I go through, I don't want to smell like smoke. I don't want to come out of it, in a sense, reeking of the tribulation. I want to, in a sense, have your work accomplished in me. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul is talking in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 about some of the, some of the challenges that he's faced. He's not in denial. 
He's not, uh, he's not saying what challenges, what, what difficulties. You know, uh, the Christian life is not one where we, uh, we just kind of like, we don't see what's around us. We, we see it. We experience it. We experience the, the challenges, the difficulties, the pains. Uh, being born again is not some inoculation against the pains and difficulties of life. Uh, I would say in some ways we probably feel them as deeply and as acutely as anyone. We, we feel them in a very intense way. Uh, and so in chapter 4, he's talking about some of, the, some of the challenges. Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels. In other words, it feels like, ah, you know, it's the, the vessel is chipped, the vessel is marred, but we have a treasure inside. Verse 8, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I want you to catch something. This is not denial. He's not saying everything's fine. It's all great. It's all the better. He's not saying that. In other words, he faced tremendous difficulty, but he faced it with the confidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in his life and in the saints. Verse 12, beautiful verse. So then death is working in us, but life in you. In other words, it's not just what he's doing in me, it's actually what he's doing around me. Think about that for a second. Sometimes we say, Lord, why are you doing this? Make it make sense to me for me. And the Lord's saying, eh, actually, you're not the only one in this equation. <laughs> you know, death is working in us, but life in you. There's actually a lot of moving parts that God is dealing with and the things that we go through are not just about us and ours. It's much bigger than that. And so the Apostle Paul is speaking here with this great confidence. And then we get to verse 16, one of my favorite, favorite passages. Verses 16, 17, and 18. I want you to write it down on your memory card. Make, the, make this one of your memory sections for memorizing the Word of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. What he means by that is even though there's trouble. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. You know what God's plan? God's plan is for us, even though there's struggle around us, there's difficulties, we feel the pressure, something on the inside is just being renewed. There's a bubbling up. There's a bubbling up. You know, when the Holy Spirit is working inside of us, in spite of what we go through, there's something bubbling up on the inside. And then verse 17 and 18, I quote these two verses to myself all the time. I mean, in terms of Bible verses that are like going through my head all the time, but this momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are unseen are eternal. In other words, Saints, we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we see everything that's going on around us just like everyone else does. We probably see it as acutely and as clearly as anyone does, but we see something else. We don't look simply at that which is temporal. We look beyond it to see the eternal. And with that, there is this sense of a renewing day by day by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you prophetically, and it came to pass. And it came to pass. And I want to, in a sense, give you a kind of an invitation to kind of just drink in with confidence the reality that Christ is using whatever you're going through for his purposes, not only in you, but in others around you. And that these things actually do have eternal... I don't know where we're going with all this stuff. I don't know where our culture is going. I don't know where our society is going. Uh, we live in perilous times, but I'm confident that Jesus, who said he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, is actually building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so we've got, with that confidence, a sense of the Holy Spirit reviving us, the Holy Spirit renewing us. I want to pray right now. Some of you are facing tremendous discouragement, depression, all kinds of stuff. I understand it. It's real. You're not faking it. It's not, it's not like a mirage. There are difficulties. There are challenges. There's a, uh, there's a, there's a kind of a, a, a real concerns and anxieties that have gripped so many, and it came to pass. Father, I come before you today, and I pray, oh God, in the midst of whatever we're facing together and whatever individuals and families might be facing on top of all that, the continued challenges of life. Lord, I pray 
that there would be a renewing of the Holy Spirit, a day-by-day refreshing. Father, I pray today that with the confidence that you will wipe away every tear and you will dry every every tear-soaked eye and every tear-soaked cheek. Lord, I thank you. With that, I pray for a renewing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, for some who are weighed down, weighed down with, with troubles and discouragements, Father, I pray, O oh God, that you would witness to their hearts today in a fresh way the work of the Holy Spirit in them, through them, and around them. Father, I ask for that in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego moments. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that the testimony of the saints in the years to come would be, as they look back to this season, we, it would be that, Lord, we went through difficulty. It was, a, it was a hot furnace, but you showed up. There was a fourth man, like the Son of Man. Father, I pray, O oh God, I pray, O oh God, that there'd be a, a, just an encounter with you in this season. Father, I pray for some who are very, very weighed down uh, today here. Lord, I pray, O oh God, would you break through with your joy. Would you break through, O oh God, deep within with a joy unspeakable? Father, I ask for that. Lord, I pray that there would be that renewing of the Holy Spirit that only comes through your power. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good. Well, Pastor Ben invited me to come and share uh, in, with you uh, concerning the series that you've been involved in, dealing, dealing with some, some foundational issues, and asked if I would share today on the Holy Spirit. So if you would open your Bible to John chapter 14, um, we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit this morning. And unless you stop me this afternoon and this evening, and uh, <laughs> there's so much we could talk about with the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14 is where we're going to we're going to kind of use that as our our launch pad uh, concerning the Holy Spirit. I want to begin uh, with prayer. Father, I do thank you for the Helper, the Comforter. Holy Spirit. And Lord, I ask you to uh, really speak to us today. Lord, I thank you that what we're engaged in here this morning, um, it's not like a university lecture hall uh, with a, uh, a lecturer and some listeners. Lord, your word is alive and your spirit is at work. And I pray, oh God, I pray that you would give me grace by your spirit uh, to communicate clearly and communicate truthfully. But at the end of the day, my confidence is not in the power of my oratory, my communication, but in the confidence that the Holy Spirit will speak. And so I do pray, even as we consider the work of the Holy Spirit today, Holy Spirit, would you be at work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit is not a doctrine. There is a doctrine that we can teach. We talk about systematic theology and different areas of theology. Uh, theology, Christology, ecclesiology, eschatology, and there is a doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We refer to it often as pneumatology. Pneuma meaning breath or wind or air. But the Holy Spirit is not a doctrine. The Holy Spirit is Christ himself living inside the believers. The Holy Spirit is the very presence of God touching and filling the lives of those who are in Christ. In a few moments, we'll look at John 14, 18, where Jesus says plainly, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. 
The Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, makes us alive to God, guides us. The Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit re reveals the love of God to us and gives us confidence, actually, that we're going to share in his eternal glory. So the Holy Spirit is not a doctrine. The Holy Spirit is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is not an afterthought, an optional part of walking with Christ. The Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in us is an integral part of walking with Christ. God never intended that we would live the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke repeatedly of the coming Holy Spirit. He instructed his followers to wait in Jerusalem until they were filled with the Holy Spirit before they began the work of the gospel. And then when those believers went out and they preached, they made sure that those who heard the gospel and received were themselves filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an afterthought, not an optional part of walking with Christ. The Holy Spirit is central to discipleship. The Holy Spirit is central to walking in the power of God. I was thinking about that as I was preparing for this morning and thinking about the book of Acts. And just in some ways, the book of Acts, we studied it this past fall. The whole, was it this past fall? I have COVID brain. My time is like, I'm in the strange, I don't know when was a year ago and when was 10 years ago anymore. Um, that's not my age. No, 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 it's not, it's COVID. Um, I blame everything on COVID. I think we just studied the book of Acts. Um, but the, the book of Acts is this, is this chronology of the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, we call it the Acts of the Apostles. In some ways, the book of Acts is sometimes referred to as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, the, uh, the followers of Jesus are told to wait in Jerusalem until they're filled with the Spirit. Acts chapter 2, they actually get filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's amazing. Acts chapter 3, they're doing miracles by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, we have the prayer meeting in Acts chapter 4 where they're filled with the Holy Spirit. The place where they are is shaken and they go and preach the word in boldness. Acts chapter 5, we find out what happens when someone lies to the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, Acts chapter 6, uh, we have the raising up of the first deacons. And you know what it says? Choose from among you seven men full of the Holy Ghost full of the Holy Spirit. In other words, so chapter after chapter after chapter really is all about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an afterthought, not an optional part of walking with Christ. The Holy Spirit is central to our lives in Christ. So we should not reduce the Holy Spirit to a doctrine uh, that we simply believe, but we need to understand this is the very presence of God filling the believer. And we should be those who are actively pursuing the work of the Holy Spirit in us and through us. Not seeing the Holy Spirit as optional, but seeing the Holy Spirit as essential for our lives and for the ministry. Today we're going to start with John chapter 14. We'll, we'll see where we go from there. My hope is that we walk out of here today with a real expectation for the power of the Holy Spirit. So, John chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Jesus here in John 14 is preparing his disciples. Let me open this up. He's preparing them for his imminent departure. Uh, he's with them. He's been with them for several years. He's been training, with, training them. Um, and they haven't put together all that's going to be happening yet. Jesus is now preparing them. And so in chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also and where I go, you know, and the way, you know. This is a passage that is often read, and appropriately so, at uh, funerals or memorial services. 
I go to prepare a place for you. And so Jesus is basically saying, I'm leaving. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come and get you again. So he's speaking uh, in a way eschatologically. He's speaking about future things, but he's preparing them for his departure. And of course, they, they respond. They're not fully understanding how this could happen. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not worry, know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Now, the disciples still aren't putting things together. Uh, they're thinking Jesus, Jesus speaking about the Father, he's taught them much about the Father, and they're thinking spatially, this spatial division. Jesus is here, the Father's there, Jesus is leaving, he's going to be gone. Now Jesus and the Father are out there, and we're stuck here behind. So they're thinking in those terms. They're not understanding that the very presence of the Father is in Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. And so he says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father, verse 7, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now we wonder, what, what does this have to do with what's about to follow? Because he's going to start talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus is basically saying, I've been walking in the Spirit all this time. That's what you've been witnessing. Because they're going to be troubled. Okay? In other words, he, he says to them at the beginning, let not your heart be troubled. The idea of Jesus leaving, that could be very troubling. In other words, how are we going to do this without Jesus? It doesn't make sense. Jesus is now saying, I've been walking in the power of the Spirit, the presence of the Father in me, and I am in the Father. And you know what? He's basically saying, I'm the prototype. What you've been watching for three years. I'm the prototype of what you can experience. Verse 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, uh, that, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now here Jesus is referencing, certainly it's prayer in the most general sense, but Jesus is really talking here about the fact that the believers will fulfill, they will continue to fulfill the mission of the kingdom of heaven on earth. And I want you to think for a moment. The disciples, I mean, they're watching Jesus. They're seeing the miracles. They're hearing the teaching. And they're happy to be a part of this, of this, uh, you know, this, uh, this, this, this cohort, so to speak. But the idea of Jesus leaving, they don't have a box for it. How is, this gonna, how is it going to stay afloat? without Jesus here. So Jesus is basically saying, what you've seen in me, it's the prototype for what you're going to be doing, and actually, you're going to be doing the same things I was doing. Let's continue. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. You've watched the prototype, you're going to continue, and you are going to experience the power of the very Spirit of God in you, mobilizing you, energizing you, filling you, and guiding you. Verse 19. A little while longer, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Okay, the question reveals that they're not, 
They're not getting it yet, understandably so. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Verse 25, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. We'll stop there for now. It's an amazing passage. Again, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his imminent departure. Um, he's talked about the Father. They clearly have watched, they've observed his interaction with the Father in prayer. You know, there are times in the, in the Gospels when it's clear the, the disciples are saying there's something going on with Jesus and the Father that show us, teach us how to pray. Te you know, they're watching this. They're seeing it happen. And Jesus is basically saying before he leaves, it's the prototype for what you will walk in after my ascension. Now, the disciples, probably a little uneasy still. You know, it's hard to picture. What, what's he talking about? Can you imagine pre-day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, hearing this? You're just not sure how this is going to work out. But there's almost a sense in which Jesus is like, yeah, it's, it's going to be. Just trust me. Trust me. I will come to you. And so Jesus instructs the disciples after his, after his uh, resurrection, before his ascension, to wait in Jerusalem until they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, they do that. They actually wait in Jerusalem. Uh, and then in Acts chapter 2, we have the story of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the believers on the day of Pentecost, uh, the feast day of Pentecost. And so we have this outpouring, and from then it's like... <laughs> Everything Jesus is speaking here comes into full view. It's almost if you can imagine it this way. Jesus is speaking, and to, to those who have not seen the fulfillment, it's prophetic. It's, it's through a glass darkly. They're trying to understand it. I'm in the Father. You're, you're, I'll, I'll, I'm coming to you. I, I in the Father, you and me. Um, it's not coming together. Acts chapter 2, it lands. Suddenly, they see now what they had heard prophetically. The prophetic, in a sense, gives you an insight, a direction. It gives you a, a, a knowledge, but then when the thing is fulfilled, it's like, this is what he was talking about. This, and Peter actually stood up in Acts chapter 2 and said, this is that. This is that. You know, all the prophetic words, and actually this is prophetic words that, that were coming through the Old Testament. Book of Joel, uh, it shall come to pass in the last days. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and on and on. Another, and, and Peter stands up. When the Holy Spirit actually falls, it's like, this is that. They realize this is the fulfillment, the Holy Spirit giving us life. I want to talk a little bit about the work of the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit makes us alive to God. When you come to Christ... When you open your heart to him, when you receive him, you are not simply embracing a set of beliefs. You might do that if you join an organization. You might do that if you change your mind about something educationally or politically. When you come to Christ, it's not simply that you're embracing a set of beliefs. The scripture says in John chapter 1, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. When you come to Christ, you are made alive to God by the indwelling Spirit of God. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Kevin, if you're able to track these quickly, I don't know, if you can, I don't know how quickly that uh, computer software runs. Titus 3, 5. Sorry, I should have given you my list. Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, I don't know which translation I have in my notes. 
He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit, a slightly different version. Uh, but basically it says, according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration, that means being made alive, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. When you come to Christ, you're made alive to God by the indwelling Spirit of God. You know, when I received the Lord, I was 19 years old, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I really didn't. Uh, I received Christ with a real concern about eternity. Um, I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed forgiveness. And I was very concerned about my eternal destiny. So I came to Christ. And I had confidence that by coming to Christ, I would be forgiven of my sins, and I would someday share in heaven with him. What I didn't know was what was in between. I had no idea. I, I couldn't imagine living on this, living this life on this world with, as a believer. I could kind of imagine heaven, but I couldn't imagine the interim. And wasn't I in for an exciting journey as the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, began to work in me, began to give me a sense of the presence of God, an awareness of God himself. It was like I realized I'm not just a person who has prayed a prayer that might affect my eternity. I'm a new creation. I'm not the same. I've been made alive to God. So the Holy Spirit, God's presence, Jesus said, I'll not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is a teacher who reminds us of Jesus' words. John 14, 26, Kevin. John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Boy, that's comforting. I need that one. I need that one. You know, when Darlene and I were getting ready for our first child, Danica was about to be born, and somewhere during the pregnancy, I had the revelation, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know the first thing about parenting. It was like terrifying. It was terrifying. Now, fortunately, we had great folks around us, uh, many folks in the church, and we were able to, uh, you know, learn a lot of things. I'm telling you, to start out the Christian life like I did, I was terrified. I, was like, I, don't, I don't know how to do this. I, it was the interim I was concerned about. I don't know how to live the Christian life. I don't know how to live the Christian life if I'm not doing the stuff I've been doing that's wrong. <laughs> What's left? <laughs> you know, what do you do? I mean, how, how do you live? I, I, I was terrified by it, and wasn't I amazed that the Holy Spirit taught me? I'm telling you, I, I, I was shocked, thrilled, when I would begin to read my Bible, because the Christians around me said, you know, read your Bible, keep reading your Bible, and they would encourage me, encourage me to come to Bible studies. I'd read my Bible, and like suddenly, it's like, whoa, whoa, that... That, that, that just jumped off the page. That, what's going on there? And it's like verses just pop out, and I realize, that's for me. God's speaking to me. I mean, like, this is an intimidating book. I don't know if you can remember be, you know, the first time you picked up a Bible. You know, where do you start? I had somebody just ask me last week, you know, where, where do you start reading? You know, some people start at the beginning. He said, I heard that, you know, he said, Billy Graham said, start in the middle. So he was asking me, where's the middle? Um, and, I, and I think what he meant was, start in the New Testament, maybe the, uh, the, the Gospel of Matthew. Um, it's an intimidating book. You know, the Holy Spirit will open the book for you. The Holy, Holy Spirit will, will speak to you, quickening the very Word of God, teaching you along the way. Another thing, the Holy Spirit re reveals God's love to us. Romans 5.5, 5. we looked at this a moment ago, but Romans 5.5, 5, a phrase from there, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You know, there are different ways you'll know you're loved by God, but you know what one of the chief ways is? The Holy Spirit witnesses to your heart. The Holy Spirit reveals it to you. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, a long, longer section, Kevin, if you can find that one. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Again, I'm sorry, I don't know if I have the same 
uh, uh, version in my notes that you have. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Now, the Apostle Paul, I want to stop for a moment. The Apostle Paul was an amazing teacher. If the conveyance of knowledge from one person to another was sufficient, he would have said that. In all of his preaching, you know what his prayer was? Holy Spirit, would you speak? Holy Spirit, would you reveal Christ? If you don't reveal Christ, it doesn't matter. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The Holy Spirit revealing the love of God. The Holy Spirit tells us that God is in us and that we are in Him. 1 John 4.13. 1 John 4.13. The version I have in front of me. And God has given us His Spirit as proof that we live in Him and He in us. What does the New King James says? Because he has given up his spirit, we know that we abide in him and he in us. The same language that Jesus used in John chapter 14. The Holy Spirit transforms us. If you could go to Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, we have the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the transforming work of the Spirit of God, evident in our lives. I was thinking about this. I, I had a conversation with a... Uh, a pastor friend of mine, we've known each other for like 30 years, maybe maybe more, probably, yeah, 40. Um, and uh, uh, we were just talking, he shared a testimony with me about his mom coming to Christ a couple of years ago. His mom passed away recently. And he said, you know, she later in life, she came to Christ. And he said, when she prayed to receive the Lord, he says, I wasn't sure if she was understanding it. I wasn't even sure if her motivation was correct. You know, I don't know if you've ever prayed with somebody you're kind of like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why they're praying this. Um, but she prayed, and then he, he and his wife, just a couple of weeks later, were talking about his mom's opening her heart to Christ. And he said, boy, he said to her, I said, he said, I don't know if she was praying for the right reason. And his wife said, have you interacted with your mother in the last two weeks? She has never been known for being a very nice person. <laughs> she has been transformed. She is suddenly one of, one of the most wonderful, peace-filled, just affirming people I know. And this brother said, I, I, I thought, my wife's right. Where's my mom? Where, where, what happened to my mother? <laughs> you know, he, he suddenly realized that the fruit of the Spirit was on work. He said, for the next two years until her death, he said, it was amazing. It was like a totally different person. That's the work of the Spirit. Think about the Apostle Paul for a moment. He's introduced to the scene in the book of Acts. And he is a hate-filled, bitter Christian killer who has just got this vendetta against those who are followers of Christ. And now today, 2,000 years later, we read his letters. Ah, the love I have every time I think of you. <laughs> Can't wait to be with you again. Oh, I have you in my heart always. Saints, people don't turn over new leaves like that. That is not, that is not a person like new leaf that somebody on January 1st, whatever year, decided I'm going to be a better person. You can't do that. The work of the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Oh, I should read your translation. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such... There is no law. What that means is, doesn't matter. Nobody can legislate to stop that. Amen. Nobody can stop it. In other words, the situations you face, 
They're not enough to stamp it out. You know, every time I think to myself, you know, I'd be more loving if the people around me would be more cooperative. It's like the Holy Spirit says, they don't have to cooperate. The, the love of God can be on display in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, even in a hostile world. Think about Jesus for a moment, our prototype. Did he have a world that cooperated? Absolutely not. And you know what? He was the fruit of the Spirit on display. So we have the, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, transforming us. We have the gifts of the Spirit. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you don't have to pop that one up there, Kevin, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the, the gifts of the Spirit, the supernatural power of God. Uh, saints, I, I, I get excited when God moves by His Spirit. I get excited when someone gets healed. I get, some, I get, I get excited when, when there's a prophetic word. I get excited when the, when the Holy Spirit is on display, when there's tongues and interpretation, with the discerning of spirits, the operation of the Holy Spirit. When you look through the book of Acts again, you see this cataloging of God at work in these absolutely amazing ways. And I was, uh, we're, we're, uh, for the church in New York City we, City, we started a series in the book of Philippians a couple of weeks ago. And I was thinking about Paul's initial entrance into the city of Philippi. And I was thinking, boy, it's really kind of amazing how he even got there. He's trying to go one direction to preach, doing the will of God, and the Holy Spirit stops him. And so he says, okay, can't go there, I'll go here. And the Holy Spirit stops him. And then he gets this vision from heaven of a man from Macedonia asking for help. And he deduces from that, oh, the Holy Spirit wants us to go in that direction. He ends up in Philippi. People start getting saved, the first European converts in the city of Philippi. I mean, the gospel explodes from there. And you know what? It's because of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's absolutely wonderful, and we need to celebrate that. And I would say we need it as much or more today than ever, the operation of the Holy Spirit. And I'll share one more. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of eternity to come. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of eternity to come. If you turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Colossians 1, 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's speaking in some ways to Jewish believers here, and he's saying basically God has a plan, and it was to bring in the Gentiles, and you know what? It's the Holy Spirit in them. Giving us, when it says the hope of glory, that phrase basically means what we have now is the down payment of what's to come. It's just the promise of what we'll share with him forever and ever. Ephesians 1.14, Kevin, if you could go there. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he'll give us the inheritance he promised. Ephesians 1.14. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit at work in us, evident to us, is the promise of greater things to come. The Holy Spirit is not a doctrine. There is a doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We can study about the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is Christ living in the believer. And the Holy Spirit is not an afterthought, an optional part of the Christian life. And so we see in some ways here, I've talked about the works of the Holy Spirit, the promise or the instruction that Jesus gave concerning the Holy Spirit, the, the operation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Saints, what I want to share as we kind of bring this to a close is this. With all of that, we should be a people who are hungry for the Holy Spirit, desiring the Holy Spirit, looking for the Holy Spirit, asking for the Holy Spirit, and purposing, in a sense, to be open to the Holy Spirit at work in us. And so I want to look at two scriptures quickly concerning that. First of all, Luke chapter 11.
Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 1. The disciples asked Jesus, uh, would you teach us to pray as John's disciples taught him, to, taught, uh, John, John taught his disciples to pray. And so Jesus gives us what we call the model of prayer. Uh, when you pray, verse 2, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And you're all probably familiar with that. Now Jesus continues actually, after giving this model for prayer, he gives a parable and then a specific instruction. In other words, he says, here's the model for prayer, and here's the promise of prayer, and while you're at it, start here. So he gives the pattern. He gives the parable in verse 5. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey. And I have nothing to set before him. He will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Now, parables are interesting because if we take them as allegory, we can get, we can get confused. If you try to say, well, this person is this, this person is this, this person is this, um, it starts to get a little convoluted. The point of the parable is, you know what, and when you pray, Jesus gave us the pattern, and now he says, and when you pray, guess what, you're going to get answers. But he goes further in verse 9, and this is what I want to focus on. And then he says, and start right here. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? He could stop there, but he doesn't. In a sense, he comes to the, uh, you know, the, the, the climactic verse in this whole section. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? In other words, he's going somewhere with this. You know what it is? We need to be a people who are hungry for the Holy Spirit. And being hungry, we can have confidence that our prayers will be answered. You know, some of you have a story of the Holy Spirit being poured out in your lives. And that's good. But today, February 14th, 2021, whether you have a story in the past of being the, having the Holy Spirit poured out in your life, whether it was a decade ago, two decades ago, ten days ago, guess what? Today's a new day, and guess what we need today? We need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need that today. And so in some ways, all of this comes together saying we should be a people who are hungry for the Spirit of God. We should be a people who are waking up saying, I need more Holy Ghost. I need more Holy Ghost. You know, when you're facing the challenges of life, whether it's COVID, whether it's finances, whether it's difficulties you might be facing personally, you know what you need more than anything else? You need more Holy Ghost. You need the comforter. You need the teacher. You need the guide. You need the Holy Spirit at work in you. One of the things that I've been challenged with is to not be passive when it comes to seeking the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 9. So I say to you, in other words, Jesus is kind of like focusing now the teaching. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be open to you. That is not a passive posture. He's not saying, so be passive because your Father loves you and just, just kind of wait. He's saying, no, because he loves you and because of the promise of prayer and because of the promise of his kingdom, press in. Seek him. I mean, get in there. Get in the presence of God. Ask for more Holy Ghost. Ask for the power of God. Ask for all kinds of things, but it's an active posture. Generally speaking, many of the churches I go to, in many, many places, the approach to much kingdom truth is very, very passive. God loves us. If he wants to do it, he'll do it. So we just wait in a passive position. Jesus was not passive. What does it say in the scripture? The kingdom of heaven 
this is King James Version, authentic, you know, authorized version, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. There is a sense of almost like a, I am going to get this thing. Think about the woman who had the issue of blood and she's trying to get to Jesus. And you know what? She's saying, I'm going to get through this crowd and I'm going to at least touch the hem of his garment. There's a sense in which people are saying, I want in on this thing. Jesus is saying, if you want in, and if you'll ask, if you'll seek, if you'll knock, you have an experience and an encounter with the Holy Spirit daily that is waiting for you. Should we be passive in light of that promise, that power, and the person of the very Lord himself coming to fill us, coming to live inside of us? Should we be passive saying, I know he loves us. If he wants to do something, he'll do it. Instead, we should be a people who are getting stirred up, encouraged up, fired up. I'm sitting, tell you, what does Ephesians 5 say? Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Speak in yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks to, uh, for all things in the name of the Father. In other words, there's this sense of pressing in. Saints, I want to encourage you. This is a day to press it, to press in to seek the Lord tell you some of the things I do. I get into the Word of God. I get into the Word of God because you know what? I'm like, every day I wake up and I'm like, I'm just, oh, I, need, I need to get tanked up again. <laughs> you know, and your, your, your flesh gets weary. You know, why can't we just stay tanked up? I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, I haven't had any problems eating lately, I'll tell you that. Uh, uh, you know, every day I wake up a little, I'm hungry again. That's just, that's like a, that's like a, a, a lesson. It's like a, uh, you know, like a Sunday school lesson in front of you all the time. You need, you need fresh food. You need to get filled. You need the Word of God. You need fellowship. I know it's difficult with masks and distancing and all that stuff, but I, I get stirred up being around the saints. You know, I, I, I've, there are many, many times I'm like, ah, you know what, I'm kind of tired. I don't want to go to the meeting. You know, I want to just stay home in my pajamas. My wife says, but you're the pastor. You're supposed to preach. Um, you got to you gotta go. Um, no, she doesn't. <laughs> um, many times I'm like, I'm tired. I don't want to do this. But you know what? Something happens. You know, even, we've even done, you know, like Zoom teachings uh, this past year, right? You know, and I'm like, oh, you know what? It's so late. It's 6.45 p.m. It's just so late. Um, I'm allowed to say that. I'm in my 60s now. Um, I should just have a warm glass of milk and go to bed. Um, but I'm like, oh, I just kind of like, oh, I don't feel like it. And oh, okay, I'll, I'll just do it and see who's there. And You know what happens? I get stirred up. I get stirred up. I get built up. I don't want to do it, but I need it. I need it. You know, I got, I got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 19 years old. A few months later, I started speaking in tongues. You know, one of the things, one of the things I do to get filled up with the Holy Ghost? I pray in tongues. I'm, I'm telling you, I'll be driving in my car. I'm on my way to meetings. And, you know, when, I, when I'm meeting with people, I don't have any sense at all that Rick Sinclair has anything to offer. I really don't. I'm like, God, I need you to come through, and I will pray in the Spirit. I will pray and say, God, I need you to move. Whatever you want to say, whatever little thing, whatever big thing, you know, when you see me and I've got my yellow legal pad, I'm writing things down. You know what I'm also doing? I'm praying. God, what are you doing here? What do you want to do? What is, the, what is your word? What is the wisdom that you want to deposit? What is the healing that you want to accomplish? What is it you're doing? Because there's so many things that could be said, so many things that could be done. What is the thing that you're about right now? I'm praying, Holy Spirit, would you speak? Just constantly asking for more of the Holy Spirit. I'm eager. And you know what? The next day I wake up, start over. Start over. I need more of the Holy Spirit. Saints, I'm saying that because for too many people, believers, in too many places, the Holy Spirit is a doctrine. You've got the right doctrine, and the Holy Spirit is optional. I'm telling you, when you look through the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is Christ in you, the hope of glory, and the Holy Spirit is central to the lives of the believers. I mentioned my experience a little bit, and I'll close with this. 
I uh, gave my life to Christ um, right before my sophomore year of uh, uh, college began. And uh, I didn't have a whole lot of experience, you might say, at the time when I prayed to receive Christ, the folks who prayed with me, they, they were very excited, of course. And in some ways, I was excited that I had made a decision after, after you know, just not sure for a long time. Um, uh, but they asked me. They seemed very excited. Are you feeling anything? I was like, eh, not really. Um, feel relieved. Um, uh, they were thrilled to no end. I mean, they were giddy. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't feel anything. Month goes by. I'm reading my Bible. And that's when it's like, it's like God starts speaking. I'm like, wow, that's, that's amazing. God's speaking through his word. And many times would be through the word of God. I want to encourage you. Look for the Lord to speak to you through his word. You don't have to understand the whole book. You just have to understand what he tells you. Let him speak to you. And then a few months later, I remember looking at John chapter 14, the text that we read earlier. And Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments, and I will come to you, and I will manifest myself to you. And I remember praying night after night, Jesus, in John 14, you said you'd manifest yourself to me. I'm asking you to do that. I'm asking you to do that. After about a three, four weeks of that, I mean, I got really, really impacted by the power of the Holy Spirit in a very dramatic way. And I'll say, looking back at that whole season, receiving Christ, those initial stirrings, and then that dramatic outpouring, I've never been the same since. But I still have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I can't simply say I have a history of experiencing him. I need him today just as much now as I ever did. Saints, I want to encourage you in this season, and this could be a great season, a great season to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you to be hungry, recognizing that Christ is in us if we've come to him by faith and he wants to reveal himself to us in absolutely transforming ways. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Worship team, why don't you come on up? Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not a doctrine. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And the Holy Spirit is not an afterthought, optional. Jesus told his disciples, don't leave Jerusalem until you're filled with the Spirit. In the book of Acts are the chronicles of people who were filled and regularly filled refilled, so to speak. Father, we come before you today, and we're hungry. Lord, if anything, the challenges, the disappointments of this world, they wean us from our attachment to things temporal. They focus us if we respond and seek you. They focus us on the things that are eternal. Father, I pray for everyone here today, those who are with us through the live stream as well. I pray for an ever-deepening encounter with you by the power of your Holy Spirit living in us, working in us, revealing your love to us. I'm picturing right now some of the young men and women, the teens in our midst. I'm not looking at you physically. I'm just, my eyes are closed, but I'm just in my spirit. I want you to know that these can be great days for you. Great days for you right now. Seek the Lord. Begin to pray. Begin to ask. Begin to seek. Begin to knock. Pray big prayers for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Open your Bible and say, Lord, would you speak to me by your Spirit? 
And then listen. Listen as you read. Ask him to fill you. Again, my eyes are closed right now. I'm picturing a few here this morning who really, life has not turned out at all the way you'd hoped. Very disappointed, and I'm sorry. Very heartbreaking, and I'm very, very sorry. You really have been through some deep, deep pains. Dreams that you had 10, 15 years ago have all collapsed. But a table in the presence of the Lord is waiting for you, nonetheless. And I want to encourage you to come and feast at that table, to ask, to seek, to knock to get into the presence of God. You say, well, I don't know how to pray. Well, you're going to learn by just getting into the presence of God, talking to Him, and then listening. Say, Lord, speak. Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. Some are, you've enjoyed a vibrant encounter with the Lord. It's been very good. Today's a day to get refreshed in that. Today's a day to realize that although the, the past is now filled with many, many exciting stories, many exciting testimonies, there's yet a future to be written. And as long as you have life, and as long as you have breath, you're part of the unfolding story of the church people of God, filled with the Spirit of God. So do not say the best years are behind, but say today, today if you hear His voice, harden not your heart. Take your place in the things of God. Begin to pray afresh. Wake up in the morning. Wake up with a song. Wake up with a scripture. Wake up praying in the Spirit and look for the Lord. Look for the dynamic of God. The world needs it more than ever. A company of people filled with the Holy Spirit going out to the highways and byways. These are days to seek the face of God and see what God might do. Saints, I want us to be hungry. Jesus, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock and it will be open to you. Let's not be passive, but let's press in. Father, right now I pray, and I want you to receive this if, if you have a hunger to hear the voice of God. Father, I pray for an opening of spiritual ears, so to speak. I pray for the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of Him. For everyone who's asking, who's seeking, who's knocking, Lord, I pray right now for an opening of the spiritual hearing and the spiritual seeing. Father, I pray that the, the coming days would be an exciting time of beginning to hear your voice and see your moving. Just as young Samuel in the Old Testament, he was being trained in the ministry. And he started to hear something. He didn't understand at first what it was. Thought it was Eli, the high priest. But then, later on, we realize it was you all along. Lord, I pray for that kind of training ground to go on right now. Lord, I pray for that, even during this unusual season in world history. Lord, I pray that this would be a time when the roots of the saints would go down deep and there would be a, a thriving streams in the desert. Father, I pray for that in Jesus' name.
I pray for a, a stirring of, of prophetic insight, prophetic words. Father, I pray for that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Could you lead us in a chorus? Something meditative or worshipful. Let's stand together. And as we close, we're just inviting the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, move. Holy Spirit, move. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing new life again. You caused your sun to shine on darkest nights. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. Father, we come before you, and I do pray blessing upon your people today. Father, we need your touch. We need your blessing. Father, I pray for uh, this week. I pray that it would be a time of a, of a rich stirring in you. And Lord, I do pray in these unusual times, I do pray for health. Lord, I pray that you would keep, uh, keep the saints healthy in this season, uh, free from... Uh, uh, free from the uh, very, very serious effects of the, of the disease that, uh, that's out. Uh, Father, I do pray, would you move in an amazing way. And Lord, that we would be positioned to be used by you in the coming days. Lord, in a world that is really, in some ways, imploding. We pray for that. Fill us with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Saints, God bless you. This has been a treat to be with you. Enjoy your day. Enjoy the week. And I hope you have testimonies of the workings of God in the days to come. God bless.